Hey, Facebook fans. Good evening. My name is Sarah Osheim, and I'm here with my friends Jen Feaster and Dr. Gary Mendes, like Wendy's. And uh, we are all Impact Melanoma supporters. We're really pleased to have been asked to help facilitate one of their sessions, um, their live Facebook sessions. And tonight we're going to be talking about parenting and taking care of our kids in the age of coronavirus and in normal times, sun protection, of course. Um, and how we're all sort of managing our responsibilities right now, how we're all coping and getting by. So I'll briefly share about myself. I'm from Western Massachusetts. Um, I'm a 22 year melanoma survivor, have a couple of kids, uh, Sabrina and Jesse, and um, working full time. And I'm gonna pass it now over to Jen and Jen can introduce herself. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Jen Feaster. I live in Framingham, Massachusetts. I have one husband, two kids, two cats, one puppy, a full-time job, and uh, I'm, I've am i been affiliated with Impact Melanoma for several years now as a member of their um, Boston Marathon team, so I'm very happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Jen. And Dr. Gary. Thanks, Sarah and Jen. I'm uh, Gary Mendes. I live in Linfield, Mass. I um, work as a dermatologist primarily with skin cancer up in New Hampshire and then in PVD Mass. I have a wife and five kids at home. Um, we have one one girl, four boys, and we have a dog, eight-year-old dog too. So it's busy nonetheless. That's pretty busy. Yeah, it's fun. Keeps us young, right? <laughs> Well, great. We are really, really grateful to have you, Jen and Gary, here with me because I think you're going to be much better um, positioned to answer some of the questions we have about really how do you manage the balance of, you know, the demands on your um, your professional responsibilities now and, you know, taking care of your kids during this hectic time. So first question, really, how do you encourage your kids? This is for Jen. Um, how do you encourage your kids to stay protected from the sun when they're outside? When, again, given the kind of crazy times we're in with the coronavirus, sun protection may not feel like it's the top of your list right now. Like, what are some things you can do to make it easier? Um, just some simple things to help make sure that sun protection is still really built into your routine. Sure. Well, I think the routine piece of it is the key, that my kids have had this drilled into their minds since they were little. And uh, my 13-year-old daughter is really good about it. She is every day, sunscreen, moisturizer, the whole nine yards. Um, and my son knows to put his arms out and, uh, and get sprayed before he leaves the house. So um, we've just tried to keep things as, as routine as, as normal life. Um, if we're going out to walk the dog, if we're going outside to play, we just do what we do. Um, and now that it's nicer, the sun is out more, it's more top of my mind as well. So I just have all of the, uh, the variety of sunscreen products by all of the different doors that they could go out. And um, luckily, they're, they're pretty well drilled at this point. And they know that this is just what we do. It's not an option. It's just life. You got all the exits covered. Mm -hmm. I do. That's yes. a good one. <laughs> And Gary, for you, maybe you could share for us, like what are some best practices when you think about um, trying to stay stress-free? I know, I know that's hard in, again, normal times, but right now, you know, we're living in a whole new world and, you know, it's very difficult to maintain our sanity uh, when there are so many stresses on us. You know, we're used to juggling a lot of balls as working parents, but right now, trying to do part of that work from home, um, can you know be extra demanding? So how how are you managing to juggle all those responsibilities and keep your sanity? Uh, so I kind of laughed about this uh, being sent my way before we got on this broadcast because uh, just because I have five kids does not mean I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but that being said, uh, I think it it's not easy, right? It's not easy for anybody. I don't think that there's a cookie cutter recipe uh, to, to do this well. Uh, but for me, what, what I found uh, to be most successful, I guess, and it took some several weeks to actually implement this was to actually have time limits for everything. And you have to, you have to know when to unplug and when to shut things off. And we always talk about that even outside of this environment, but it's really important now because you literally cannot mm. um, have a firm concrete line between 
home and work or home and school, they're just all enmeshed. So uh, for me, I took um, email off my phone. So I have to actually sit at a computer and check my email. I have a, a, a an alarm that goes off at six o'clock that tells me not to check again or not to, or to put my my phone away. Um, the kids have a routine where they do their schoolwork from 10 to two, and then they don't have anything else really until the end of the day, uh, uh, that the next day or at night, if there's something um, left over, I think really it's just a matter of hard concrete lines of when you do it and when you don't, if you just do a little bit here and there, it just drags out forever. So that's mm -hmm. what's worked for us. I like your suggestion about taking email off your phone. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. If you can't, I mean, it's always screaming your name, right? Come look at me. Right. Your stupid phone is, you know, ask, you just checked it. You don't need to check it again. Right. Right. So it's, yeah, it forces me to sit down and um, pay attention to emails that need to be paid attention to and at a focused period of time rather than just constantly. Yeah. I like it. I've been trying to compartmentalize more myself, but I think that's a really good concrete strategy. I'm going to try it. So let's see. So Jen, maybe you could share from your family, um, what, you know, give us an example of like what your typical routine is now. You know, Gary shared a little bit about how he's um, structured, scheduled blocks of time for his kids to work on schoolwork. How does it work in your house? Well, it's a lot better now than it was a few weeks ago. In the beginning of all of this, it was a, a bit of a free for all. And I think part of that was because we didn't really have a good understanding of how long this was going to last. Mm -hmm. uh, but now uh, the schools are much better at the routine. Uh, we are much better at the routine. So similar to what Gary said, um, I have with my kids 10 o'clock to two o'clock. I collect your, uh, what, what do we call them? Your, your, your fun devices. <laughs> I take your phones, I take your iPads and they do their schoolwork um, and they have various meetups and things, right? So we have calendars for that. Um, and the other thing I've tried to do is keep some kind of semblance of normal bedtime. It's mm. a lot different than normal bedtime in the real world. But, uh, you know, we try to say everybody turns their devices over to mom at this time of night. Um, we try to make sure everybody's sleeping well, everybody's eating. Because, you know, if you're off your, your normal schedule, you might forget to eat breakfast, forget to eat lunch. So we're just trying to keep those things as regular as possible. And luckily my, um, you know, in my job, I, uh, I have the, the flexibility to just block my calendar and say, hey, my kids are starting up at 10 o'clock. So from 9.45 to 10.15, I block my calendar out so I can make sure I get them going. Everybody started. Um, so it's, it's just much better now that we can, we can plan ahead and we, mm -hmm. we have a good expectation of, of what mm -hmm. this is going to look like. It really helps. I think people are settling into a new normal or, you know, and um, I, you know, I know in my house that um, I'm heavily reliant on my husband who has more flexibility with his work than I do. Um, and he never envisioned that he would be um, a schoolmaster, <laughs> uh, but you know, he's, um, he's risen to the challenge. It's, it's, it's been very telling for us, just to your point about how much we all, I think, crave the routine and the structure and how disoriented we felt in the early days of the closures when we were all navigating this new reality and um, didn't have really the routine to lean into. So I think it's really helpful for all of us. So Gary, are there any tricks, you know, tips or tricks that you can share with your five kids uh, that, you know, when, when they're struggling or they're having difficulty and, you know, um, I think Jen's points about just making sure we're doing the basics around sleeping and eating well and keeping ourselves regulated, anything else like in your toolbox that has come up to help get them back on track or, you know, just sort of find their rhythm again when, when they're having difficulty? Um, I, well, it's definitely not easy, but I think one thing that does not or has not been particularly helpful is to just assume that kids are as adept at computers and electronics as as mm. we assume that they are um that they are you know they're great at a touch screen they're great at their phones so of course they can just hop online and do xyz and it'll only take a few minutes for them to get ready they've never had to do this before even google classroom i don't know if your kids are on google classroom i assume they are it's not always that easy to navigate um or sometimes they they click one thing and all their work is gone it's very frustrating for them yeah. um so i think um 
being there, as Jen had alluded to in the very beginning of the kids' classroom, uh, it really doesn't matter how old they are. We've got a first grader and we've got a freshman, and they both sometimes need a little assistance in, in getting going. So I think just, just being there is helpful. Um, and also what, what also does not work or hasn't worked for us is to just tell them how easy this is compared to what the normal school year or school day is like, because that's not helpful. Um, it could, we feel that way. You look at the amount of work that they have and you feel like, wow, this is a joke compared to what they would normally do in school. But it's so different and they come at it from a, such a different um, uh, view, vantage point that um, I, at least in my kids, having that sort of attitude is counterproductive and then they end up getting frustrated and, and angry and half the time they're not really they're either not paying attention or they turn in half completed work and um, mm -hmm. i think just telling them every once in a while that you you understand that this is frustrating and this is not easy it's not easy for us it's not easy for them and trying to navigate through the computer uh, the electronic aspects as best we can yeah. is just to provide some support i mean yeah. it's doing what we can i guess well, and I realize it's, it's an oversimplified question for, you know, any parent that has more than one child, because every child, of course, is different. So, you know, your response to each of them would be depending on them and their circumstances and their anxieties and their coping skills. But um, I think I, I appreciate your point about um, just not making assumptions about their capacities, whether it be for technology related assignments or, um, you know, just coping with the uncertainty of this time and how, you know, the relative ease of of schoolwork, um, whether it's real or not, you know, they, they're not experiencing the social act aspect of school right now, which, you know, is is obviously so important. So I think um, the just being there and being responsive, like you said, what it really boils down to. And speaking of being social, what I'm realizing watching our live comments is that I've never, you know, I'm not really super experienced with facilitating live Facebook sessions, but I think we're supposed to be interacting with our live guests, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we should be shouting out to, for example, Dr. Robin Travers, which is great to see you, Dr. Robin. Hi, Dr. Robin. Hey. <laughs> and we see, let's see, Lindsay Ramsey. Hi, Lindsay. And my friend, hey, Emily Sullivan. Oh, Emily, I miss you. Missy Wells Abbott, the Abbott family. Hi, Abbott family. Great to see you. Thank you all for joining us. And remember that you can feed us questions um, that we can, you know, be happy to answer as a group. Um, so if you have anything that you'd like to inquire about around managing family responsibilities right now, around sun protection, please shoot it our way in the in the thread, and we'll I'll do a better job of reading those. Uh, so let's and let's get back to to Jen and Gary. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, we were thinking now about even today, the governor um, issued some new guidance around uh, a planned approach to to reopening. And we're thinking about like once once the restrictions are lifted and our lifestyle changes again, although it may not look the same as it was pre COVID-19, um, people are going to be excited to get outside again. I think it's going to be hard to keep all those sort of restrictions on ourselves when we're so hungry to be outside and um, be with our peers and be with our friends. So. I, I'm going to shoot this really to both of you, um, and we'll start with you, Jen. Like, what suggestions or reminders would you offer, really, for your? Let's start with your kids um, about sun protection. Um, you know, not just now, but going forward, when they're not going to have really as many limits set on. Oh, that's a great question. You know, it's interesting. I forget. Oops. I forget with my kids sometimes. They really haven't left the house in like eight weeks. I go out, you know, I go to the grocery store, I go and I do what I need to do. I go out and walk the dog. Um, and, and for the kids, it's almost like a whole new world. They go outside and they're like, oh, is the world changed, you know? And it's, I think there's a couple things. It's important to remind them that yes, lots has changed, but a lot, a lot hasn't, you know, it's still the same world. Uh, it's just how we interact with it. That's different. Um, and reminding them that all the things that we used to do before this, we still do. We still put on our sunscreen. Mm -hmm. We still get, for some of my kids, we still get dressed. <laughs> you know, we still <laughs> <laughs> your pants when we go outside, right? That kind of thing. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important. And um, we have this great opportunity right now to kind of prepare them to reenter the world, right? Like, so, you know, Impact Melanoma has this great Your Skin is In program. My daughter is 13 and she's perfect, right, to do this. And what better way to give your kids health class, right? Hey, I've got this great program. And for my daughter, um, who is in a bilingual program, she's going to do that program in Spanish. So we're killing all these birds with one stone, right? So much opportunity Absolutely. to really start fresh. So, um, you know, we're just going to go with that. It's brilliant. Gary, you have anything to add? I think uh, the, the only thing that I would add to um, sort of force the kids to, to use sunscreen is to just make it available everywhere. Um, you know, leaving it in multiple places so that it is sort of part of the routine, either by your toothbrush, by the door, um, uh, by the front steps, wherever. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's useful to actually to uh, provide sunscreen in multiple different vehicles. Um, the spray, a lotion, even the, the sticks are particularly helpful. If you know, you, you've got a, a kid that does not want you near him or her, like my almost 16 year old daughter, um, that, but also doesn't want to be applying sunscreen where she doesn't have a mirror so she can see if it's rubbed in the <laughs> sticks are clear and they rub in clear, almost like a, like a fine, a thin wax. Um, so there's never an excuse. Yeah. for them to not put it on if they have um, a spray when it's quick, if they've got something clear and it's a stick that you don't need a mirror for or just the lotion. So um, that's helpful too. And the sprays are okay. Uh, that's a question I always have. Like if, if, if my kids do this and I spray them down, that's okay. Sprays, sprays are great as long as they get on you and you're not breathe, inhaling them. So we use sprays all the time. I think they're really easy. You don't want to obviously be in the middle of a windstorm when you're using them. And if you're <laughs> going to put them on your face, I think you're going to get more of it on the skin and you're obviously not going to be inhaling it. If you spray it into the palm of your hand and then put it on your face, just like you would if it was a, a, a lotion. But I think sprays are great. You just have to rub them in afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've got a, one of Impact Melanoma sunscreen dispensers right outside, mounted on the wall, right outside our back door. And um, so I found that if our kids somehow get out of the house without, you know, the inside quantities of sunscreen, they actually love using the dispenser because it's fun. Um, and, you know, it's handy. It's right there near the bikes and near all the backyard toys. And it's bright yellow. And it's, a, it's just a great reminder that, you know, sunscreen is everywhere in our family. <laughs> you can't hide from it. And you're going to put some on before you go outside. So, and I wanted to mention we're doing actually as part of this live session, we are doing a. Um, it's not a giveaway, guys. What's it called? It's a contest. Contest. It's a contest, right? So, if you let's see, in order to enter the contest, you just need to click on there. Should be a link to the contest um, in the description of the live session link, and you can click on that, enter a little bit of information you'll be entered to win a free melanoma impact melanoma sunscreen dispenser uh, for your family or, you know, maybe for your community. They're really fantastic. And all you got to do is click on that link and uh, the winner will be announced during the live session on May 22nd, which is don't Friday. So stay tuned for that. So uh, let's see. We also have some more questions in our thread. Let's read through and see. Missy Wells Abbott says, as a teacher, I love the your skin is in. I have taught this to our students in fifth grade and trying to figure out how to share this with my students at grade level, um, as a grade level at this point through online. So that's fantastic. Um, we've got a couple other questions about your skin is in. Um, Nick Parenti asks if there are materials that go along with your skin is in. Um, we do have many materials actually. There are lots of resources on Impact Melanoma's website. So that answers Missy's question that you can use. Um, there's a teacher's guide there. There are quizzes that are available. Um, there's a digital copy of the Your Skin is in Pledge, videos and posters you know, um, that you can access. So be sure to check out Your Skin is in on impactmelanoma.org. And that should give you a lot of those resources that you're looking for. Let's see, other questions. What other questions are you seeing, Gary and Jen? There's an interesting one there about um what to do if you feel like you need to get your skin checked, but your dermatologist's office is closed. That seems mm -hmm. like a really good one. Yeah. Dr. Gary. Sure. 
Well, you can also uh, review Dr. Robin Travers' uh, self-skin exam video from last week. Um, but if there are things that are, are concerning to you, we almost every office that I'm aware of is offering virtual visits. It's, it's difficult to do an entire full body skin exam through um, through an iPad or something. But we can certainly have um, we can do a little bit of a, of a of an overview or look at targeted lesions and, and tell you if it's something that needs a, a closer look or not. Um, but um, that would be that would be my best guess is to to take a look around your own skin every month or two um, and look for moles lesions that don't have a brother sister cousin nearby that look very similar to it so if you have something that doesn't match the rest you have an ugly duckling um the, the, we have the abcds abcdes that we often um go by to look for for melanomas um i'm that's all available online. I'm assuming you don't want us to go through that right here, but um, there is a way to check on your own, um, or you can reach out to um, your local dermatologist and they can probably set you up with a virtual visit. And one day in an in-person one. That's right. That's important. I love the ugly duckling um, sort of as a concept and a visual to understand that, you know, we all have our own sort of presentation of moles um, and it's important to pay attention to something that's just one-off or doesn't look like it goes with the rest of them. Um, in addition to the ABCDEs, which you mentioned and which you're right, Dr. Gary, are on Impact Melanoma's uh, website. So be sure to check out that page um, and it's uh, ABCDEs, those are warning signs of perhaps atypical moles um, and a good reason to start a conversation with your dermatologist. And we have another question here, let's see for Dr. Gary. Um, it was regarding sunscreen. This is from Missy too. Do you recommend a certain brand or type of sunscreen for kids? So uh, by and large, anything in, at least in the dermatology world that's labeled kids or pediatric is really just uh, marketing and may have a, a, a slightly, uh, a slightly more um, colorful scent to it, but really it's just as effective as anything uh, else that does not say kids on it. My favorite sunscreen that's um, that's cheap and readily available, if you don't if you, if you don't have a doctor's office that you you typically go to when you buy things in the office is a Trader Joe's spray. Uh, it's a 50, it's like seven dollars. Uh, Consumer Reports came out with a comparison of all sunscreens and compared the price, availability, and efficacy. Like how how reliable is that SPF number on the bottle? Um, and uh, Trader Joe's was number one. So it, it's a clear spray. It's inexpensive. Uh, and you can, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you did spray it directly into your kid's eyes, they wouldn't cry. It doesn't burn. <laughs> I can vouch for that actually, because I love that Trader Joe's spray. That's a favorite in my house. I think I read the same consumer report and I'll share that. So I have two kids, as I mentioned, my daughter is 17, she's Caucasian. My son is 10, he's African-American. They both follow the same rules for skin protection. Um, and uh, and in Jesse's case, you know, he, he's, he's picky about those kinds of sunscreens that he uses because with his beautiful dark skin, sometimes if I run it, rub in a product that has like zinc oxide on it, which is heavy, heavy, right? And um, right. and it's hard to rub in, and 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 you know there tends to be a film even after you've rubbed it in. And his beautiful skin it ends up looking like blue sometimes. So he loves the spray, right. and he loves the Trader Joe spray because he doesn't look blue. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's 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 a great it's a great product for for most people. I mean, there are a bunch of other sunscreens too. You know, the Elta Elta MD, for example, has a couple that are um, that are tinted. Yeah. So if you if you're trying to kill two birds with one stone and wear some sunscreen, but also maybe cover up some brown or something, uh, that's a useful one. But honestly, there are dozens of them. But for minimum, all around. Per, yeah. yeah, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask you to remind us minimum SPF. Is there a minimum? I, I tell people if you're really you, if you're using anything less than 30, you're probably not getting uh, the benefit that you need. 30 to 50 is fine. You don't need 100. Um, I would not go and get eight dry oil or something like that. That's not going to be helpful. 30 to 50 is fine. And it's almost all of them are, are at that number anyway. Great. 
Well, this has been great. You guys, thank you so much for sharing your wealth of information from your experience. Um, I'm going to close with a trivia question for our listeners. And the trivia question is, give me a moment. Please talk amongst yourselves while I pull it out. <laughs> All right, here we go. Pick the answer that is not true. Kids often spend a good part of their day playing outdoors in the sun, especially in the summer. Children are more likely to develop skin cancer in later years if they have A, fair skin, moles, or freckles, B, multiple blistering sunburns, C, a family history of skin cancer, or D, if you have eczema. So again, you're looking, you're going to pick the answer that is not true from those four. And you're just going to enter it into the chat thread and someone from Impact Melanoma will contact you if you are the lucky winner, which means you'll be the first one to, um, to send in the correct answer. And that's probably a wrap. Anything else that you want to say in closing, Jen or Dr. Gary? It's been delightful to no. share the session with you. Thank you for all you've shared. It's been great to connect. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank you again. And tune in again. We're going to be doing these live sessions all month with Impact Melanoma. Next Monday, May 18th, we'll be talking more about Your Skin is In. Um, our, our next live session is Monday, May 18th at, I believe it's 12. And with that, we'll thank you and we'll sign off. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>